welcome to Sunshine for Your Life. I'm going to talk to you today about one of my trips to Israel, my first trip to Israel, and tell you how it brings the Bible to life and why traveling is so important if you can do it. You can get a lot of information from books, it's true, but there's nothing like standing in front of Jesus' tomb, stepping into the tomb which you are allowed to do, and seeing the place where Jesus lay, and seeing all the places that he went and how he ministered to people. Now, I have been to the Middle East, and I love it there. It brings the Bible to life. But when you travel, you have to be willing to go with the flow. And there are a lot of things that can be confusing, and there are a lot of things that can go wrong. So I want to describe my first trip to Israel. I'd never been there, and I'd never flown overseas before, but this is my first international trip. It was a real adventure. We were, first of all, detained in New York City because our, our plane, which is an Aliyah Jordan Royal uh, Airlines, was in Amsterdam with engine trouble. And so we waited around and waited around. Uh, the people who ran the airlines took us on various tours of New York City so we wouldn't be just wasting our time. And we stayed overnight in New York. And then the next morning, our plane was still in Amsterdam with engine trouble. Some people get very nervous about that. I called my mother, and she very wisely said, and I wasn't going to give up on it anyway, she said, well, if a plane comes and picks you up and it makes it across the Atlantic, it probably will make it back across the Atlantic. We were going to be flying to Amman, Jordan first before we got to Israel. So uh, we were about a day and a half late getting off the ground, most of our time spent on tours of New York City. It was interesting what I saw in New York City, and I was kind of glad it happened, because I saw the poverty that some people have, people actually living in boxes. And I didn't know they were living in boxes, but I'd see a hand come out of the box, pick up a pan that was outside the box, and bring it back inside the box. So I had a chance to see things in New York City that were not very pleasant to see, but it's a part of our reality. And so after one and a half days, we finally flew to Amman, Jordan. And because we were late, the, a day and a half late, we couldn't get the original hotel we were supposed to stay at, so we were put up in a less than desirable hotel. It wasn't really clean. The elevator looked so bad that nobody would use it. I wouldn't put my foot in it. And then when we got settled into the hotel, I looked out the window, and the whole hotel was surrounded with men in uniform, and they looked like they were, they were carrying submachine guns, huge, huge guns like, you know, and I'm not familiar with what guns are, but it looked like assault rifles to me. And so we waited. I wasn't afraid they weren't after us. We were just guests at the hotel. But they surrounded the building, guns drawn, until they found the person that they wanted and dragged him away. And then we got on a bus, and uh, we went to Israel. We had to stop on what's known as the Allenby Bridge. The Allenby Bridge, which now has been rebuilt, was a rickety old bridge separating Jordan from Israel. Once you cross the Allenby Bridge, you would be in Jericho. Jericho is a beautiful, beautiful city. It's one of the nicest cities you will be in if you take your trip there. And if you happen to be there when the flowers are in bloom and the fruit is out, it's absolutely gorgeous and the air is filled with beautiful fragrances like honeysuckle. We all had our windows open just breathing deeply of these gorgeous fragrances that we have. So uh, we, it, it's a very high security area on the Allenby Bridge. And so once again, we got out on the bridge, and that's never allowed to happen. But it did happen with us because our air conditioning broke. And it was about 120 degrees inside the bus and outside, too. And we were allowed to buy drinks and things like that. And, uh, and then we got back on the bus when the air conditioning was fixed. And then we went back uh, and we headed for Jerusalem. But first we went to Jericho, which is right outside the Allenby Bridge. And I said before, it's a very beautiful, beautiful area. And uh, actually what happened is that uh, as we were going up toward Jerusalem, we saw a lot of soldiers, a lot of people walking. And as it turned out, Iran and Iraq had been uh, at war, 
And so people were trying to leave the area. So they were going to the Jordanian airport to try to get on planes in order to fly to anywhere. They didn't care where, just to get them out of the area because they couldn't have passports to go to Israel. So as we were traveling and going up to Jerusalem, we could see all of these people trying to escape from war-torn areas. It was a really fascinating, fascinating uh, sight that we saw. Now, uh, the trip was well worth taking, despite all of the problems that we had. I mean, when we had went toward Jerusalem, our bus caught fire. And so we had to stop, and that had to be repaired. The bus was filling with smoke, and, uh, and uh, the men were screaming, stop the bus, stop the bus. The women weren't screaming at all, but they had to stop the bus and fix what the fire was. And then finally, we ended up in Jerusalem, where we were going to begin with. You know, you can really see God work, and you can really see what its life is like in Israel. When the Bible talks about separating the sheep from the goats, which Jesus said he will do, he will separate the sheep from the goats, you can see uh, little flocks of sheep and goats together as they lead them along with the shepherd, and the shepherd leads them. They don't push them, they don't get behind them, but they lead them. So you see the Bible come to life. You see Jesus' tomb. You see where he died and where he rose from the dead. And I think, you know, there's some question as to where the tomb really is, but I think where we, where we went really is the tomb. And the reason I say that is because the Bible talks about he's, he's buried at the place of Golgotha, Golgotha means the skull, the place of the skull. And when you get to the tomb, all you have to do is look to the right, and there's something called Skull Hill, a very high hill, but not a mountain by any means. And when the light is right, you see the face of a skull right on it. It is exactly the way the Bible says it is, exactly the way the Bible predicts it is. So you get to see living history because people are living in some cases just like they were at the time of Jesus. They're living in the same style, wearing the same kind of clothes, doing the same kinds of things. So it is a wonderful trip to take, but you just have to remember that when you go to Israel, you're gonna see life as it was in Jesus' time. And because of that, you're gonna see how, how people live and you're gonna see what they do and, how, and it's different than us. The, the society is very, very modern. If you get to modern Israel, it's very modern. You have really have old Jerusalem and new Jerusalem. And you can actually climb up on the wall. There's something called the Ramparts Wall. You climb the Ramparts Wall and you are on a very, very high wall. But of course, there's, there's uh, barriers on both sides so you don't fall off from it. You're above the roofs of many houses and you can see a whole city. You can see the old city of Jerusalem. You can see the new city of Jerusalem, a very modern city. And yet within that modern city, there are, there are a lot of people living in the way that they used to live in olden times. You have the same small square houses. You have a lot of things made out of sandstone. In Jerusalem, there is a rule, it may be for the whole country, but I know it's true of Jerusalem, that all new buildings have to be made out of sandstone. The reason for that is that it's cheap and it's plentiful. It makes a good building material, so therefore they can build all kinds of structures and they don't have to spend all kinds of money doing it. But if you're on top of that wall, you can see the division between the new and the old Jerusalem. People who are still walking with donkeys and people who are walking with their flocks through the cities and people who are living a very modern lifestyle, very modern stores. And there are various places where you pick up your fruit as you go along. There are little stands and they're selling fresh fruit or they're selling fresh vegetables. And I can tell you the vegetables and the fruit are delicious, very large. They have wonderful agriculture there because they also have a wonderful system of water supply. Israel does not have a lot of water. It's kind of in a desert. But what you can do, or what they have done, is they have managed the water so that they spray their fruits and their vegetables on a regular basis, and they get a lot of fruits and vegetables, which 
they actually send out to Europe. They export a lot of food to Europe. This is something that's probably not well known. So when you go there, be prepared to be surprised by all the things that you see. Now, uh, we are focused, of course, on the fact that this is a religious pilgrimage, and we're focusing on how Jesus lived and what he claimed to be. And the first verse I'm going to give you here is John 10, 14, which will be on the screen. And this is what it says. This is what Jesus calls himself. This is what it says. I am the good shepherd and, my, and know my sheep and am known of mine. Let me read that again. I am the good shepherd and know my sheep and am known of mine. Well, what does this mean? Sheep are remarkable. Most of people, a lot of the people who live in Israel are sheep herders. A lot of them are fishermen. They, and Jesus, when he lived, they, he talked about the common uh, way that people uh, earn their living as fishermen, as sheep herders, and things like that. You know, it was a simple, plain lifestyle. But sheep are not terribly bright. They are stubborn, they frighten easily, and they cannot protect themselves. They are completely dependent on their shepherd for their care. But when I say they're remarkable, I miss this. Sheep are remarkable in two ways. For one, they know their names. As, as unbright or as dumb as you might think a sheep is, you can teach him his name. He will know his name. And he also recognizes, and this is the second thing that makes them unusual, they recognize the voice of their shepherd. So when, they, when their shepherd calls them by name, they leave the herd and run to the shepherd. They know they are being called. And uh, this, I think, has a lot of reference to the way that God calls us because the Bible says, the sheep hear my name, the sheep hear my voice and they follow me and they won't follow any other voice except my voice. The Bible makes reference to that. So sheep know their name and they know their shepherd's voice and they recognize when their own shepherd is calling them. Now in terms of our relationship with Jesus, it's the same way. If you know the Lord and you, and you study the Bible and you know what's in the Bible, you kind of have that sense. So you have that sense of discernment, which is a gift of the Holy Spirit, and you know when God is calling you and you know when God is speaking to you. Anyone who's deeply devout will tell you that. If you're not a Christian, that may not make much sense to you, but people do know when God is calling them. So Jesus calls his sheep. Why would he call his sheep? He loves the sheep. He names each one. He can call them by name. They come. One of the things they do is when they call their sheep together, they stay with the sheep. They put their, their rod and their staff on one side of them, of the sheep, and their body is on the other side of the, of the sheep, so the sheep are cradled there. It's just, it's just an affectionate thing that they do. And then the sheep feel very, very comfortable, very protected, very taken care of. And if a stranger comes and tries to get the sheep away and calls the sheep name, the, the sheep won't go because they know it's not their shepherd calling. But when you're a Christian, you know when God is calling and you have the discernment to know when the world is calling and what you're being told, whether it's right or whether it's wrong, using the Bible as a benchmark for that. So we are, you know, the Bible says we are the sheep of his pasture. And so therefore we are his sheep. We understand his voice. We hear his voice. We listen to his voice. We study, study the scripture and it guides our life. And the sheep do the same thing because of the voice recognition. So uh, the, the sheep will always recognize their owner's name and wh when they're calling them, and they will always come when the shepherd calls them. There is another verse, John 10, 28, which we want to put on the screen now. And this is what it says. It's a, in reference to, uh, to eternal life. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Now, this is in reference to us having eternal life. But we are the sheep of his pasture, so it's our shepherd giving us eternal life. I want to read that once again. John 10, 28, And I give unto them eternal life, 
and they shall never perish. The theme of the shepherd and the sheep is prevalent in both the Old and the New Testament because the Bible says, and this won't be on the screen, but it says in Psalm 103, we are, the pe we are his people and the sheep of his pasture. I've made reference to that before. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Now in Psalm 23 in the Old Testament, it shows us that God takes care of us. It says that we, when we get into the shadow of the valley of death, and that doesn't necessarily mean we're gonna die. We can be in the shadow of death. We can be in a shadow of a very tough spot and still God walks it through us. The Bible says he will be with us and he will not leave us and nor forsake us. The life of the sheep is dependent upon the care of the shepherd. And just as the shepherd takes care of the sheep and never falters in that and stays with them for their whole lives, God stays with us for our whole lives. He never leaves us. He never forsakes us. We never have to worry about anything. Sheep cannot take care of themselves. They require a lot of care, and the shepherd is totally responsible for them. We are not as bright as we think we are. We think we lead our lives, but we can get spooked too. We get nervous, we bolt. When a sheep gets nervous, he bolts and they start to stampede. But with the shepherd close by, they're not apt to do it because the shepherd is their comfort and their caregiver, and they realize that. We are similar to sheep in many ways. We, like sheep, become fearful, timid, stubborn, have bad habits, and we're not always intelligent. We do dumb things. How many times have you done something dumb? You know, and, and after it's over with, you think, what was I thinking? Why did I do that? Well, sheep are like that. They do things that are not intelligent. But Jesus chooses us, just like the shepherd chooses his sheep. Jesus chooses us. He buys us with his sacrifice. He calls us by name. He marks us as his own, and he loves to take care of us. He's righteous. He's gentle. He's tender. He's all the things we need as our leader, and he can also be tough if necessary. Jesus is our shepherd, and he is also our savior. And all we have to do is know and accept what Jesus has done for us. He, he has already made the sacrifice for us. So you can say yes to him and say yes to his leadership in your life and become a Christian. You don't have to make him your savior. He already is your savior. He's done the work. He died. He did sacrifice his life for you. All you have to do is to make the decision that you're going to accept him into the, your life, and then you become a Christian, and he takes care of you, and you will recognize his voice and come when he calls you. Jesus loves you, and he will take care of you, and he will lead you forever. All you have to do is to make that decision to follow him, which I hope that you will do. Now I'm going to close it here. We'll be doing something else next time. Please join me then.